What are we discussing on today's Locked on Dimebacks podcast? Time for the Lord's Guriel player review. And which World Series outcome do we want to see the most? You are Locked on Diamondbacks, your daily Arizona Diamondbacks podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into the Locked on Diamondbacks podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. You're listening to who? The always charismatic host of this podcast, Miller Thomas, multimedia journalist, and demographic designer. So please go check out my website, millerthomas 24myportfoliocom On there, you can see all my latest work from my packages to my articles to my photos and my graphic design. This episode is brought to you by fanduel.com you can start the season with a big return on fanduel place your first five dollar bet and you'll get started with two hundred dollars in bonus bets guaranteed visit fanduel.com to get started on today's lockdown dimebacks podcast i want to go through steve gilbert's five questions for the d-backs all season which world series outcome will make us feel the best as d-backs fans and we'll wrap up the pod by doing our little player review as we've been doing all offseason. Today, we got Lords Guriel to discuss. So a lot I want to talk to you guys about today. But first, I want to say thank you for making Locked on Dimebacks your first listen every day. I would not be able to do this podcast without you, my loyal listeners, sharing, subscribing, reviewing, doing all that so I could do this podcast for you. Thank you. It's free. It's available on all platforms. So please continue to tell your friends. And one of those platforms is YouTube. Please hit subscribe to Locked on Diamondbacks on YouTube. All right, all right, all right. Let's get back to the Locked on Diamondbacks podcast, and let's discuss Steve Gilbert's five big questions for the D-backs this offseason. Steve Gilbert, of course, covers the D-backs for MLB.com, so this dude is super plugged in, so whenever he says something about the team, I for sure hang on on every word he writes, he says, on broadcast. And so let's go through his five burning questions for the D-backs this offseason. The first question, what will they do about their major offensive contributors this year who are going to be free agents? And that's a great question, guys like, Christian Walker, guys like A. Eugenio Suarez, who have, you know, options and Jock Peterson, Randall Gritchick. It's a great question what the D-backs are going to do with those guys. We've talked about it a bunch on this podcast, right? We've said Christian Walker feels like a guy that has to return to Arizona next year. Feels like his value to Arizona is just way more than what you could do for another team. Any team that signs Christian Walker is going to get better their ceiling is going to be raised the needle is going to move a lot but for the d-backs i think his value means more to us than any other franchise with him being a diamond in the rough that we discovered from baltimore all those years ago was giving him a full-time opportunity turning him into one of the best first basemen in the league like he's a true story about development persistence commitment to a player despite you know, not having a long track record or any really sample size of success, the D-backs took a shot on Christian Walker, and he's now turned into one of the premier first basemen in Major League Baseball. And so I think when you take all that into account, the investment you've had in Christian Walker to develop this flower, you've planted this flower, this seed, and it's blossomed into one of the best first basemen. I think that's a guy you want to keep with the power he has, the defense he has, the leadership. We love Christian Walker. He has to come back to the D-backs. Same with A. Eugenio Suarez. Third base has been a struggle for the D-backs since Eduardo Escobar has left, and A. Eugenio this past season was a major upgrade over what Longoria gave us the previous year. From a power standpoint, defense like Suarez overall we know the first half wasn't good but what he did in the second half of the season came alive offensively carried this D-backs team for stretches with his bat his glove was really good as well Suarez overall had himself a very strong year same with Jock Peterson same with Randall Gritchick honestly all the D-backs players this offseason that they picked up for their lineup were incredible even the kevin newmans were really good uh josh bell was good at the deadline and so when looking at this d-back team it is very curious to see who the d-back's going to bring back i think walker is a must i think a eugenio is a must and i think one of the two dhs either jock peterson or randall gritchick is a must as well maybe 
if you want to keep a DH, maybe don't keep either Jock or Grichik. Maybe go in the Josh Bell direction so you can have a DH and a guy that could back up Christian Walker as well. Just very curious to see what the D-backs are going to do with the free agents that they have internally because some of those guys are going to command a lot of money and the D-backs missing out on the postseason. I feel like they're going to want to cut back on the payroll just a little bit. So I honestly don't expect all the D-backs internal free agents to come back next year as long as at least a Christian Walker, a Suarez, and one of the Gritchicks or Jock Petersons come back. I'll be pretty happy with that. Question number two. What will the D-backs do with Jordan Montgomery? They can't really do anything, right? They're kind of in this holding pattern. Ken Kendrick is doing the best he can, doing media tours, telling everyone that it was a horrible decision and Jordan Montgomery essentially sucked this past season because he did 6-2-3 ERA. And so for Arizona, that's all they can do right now is talk crap about Jordan Montgomery in the media because he has a player option for over $20 million and it is in his court if he wants to pick that option up or not and Monty was bad this past season but I still believe in his talent and I believe after a full off season where we get him in a little workout program come back next season healthier in shape there's still a lot of potential within Jordan Montgomery as a pitcher I know this season was terrible but I don't think Monty's in the Madison Bumgarner point of his career like yes the numbers look very similar to mad bum but monty was coming off a world series victory where he had the best season of his career and has been getting better every single year prior to 2024 mad bum was going in the wrong direction prior to signing with arizona so i still like to believe monty has a lot more left in the tank than mad bum did when the d-back signed him question number three what to do about zach gallon Great question. Maybe the biggest thing hanging over the D-backs is offseason that won't be super discussed because Zach Allen pending free agent next season. And so should the D-backs renegotiate a contract extension for Zach Allen this offseason? Should they potentially try to sell high on Zach Allen now before they get to the deadline, especially if you go into next season? And let's say you get to the trade deadline and the D-backs are not good. Now you're selling Zach Allen at a lesser value. So maybe you should just try to sell him at his highest value right now. Or do you just play out the whole season and then give him a qualify, give him a qualify, give him a qualifying. I don't know why I can say that. Give him a qualifying offer, qualifying offer. I don't know why I can't say that qualifying offer at the end of the season. So you could get potentially a draft pick back if someone else signs him, or maybe you just renegotiate a contract extension after next season, but a lot of question marks surrounding Zach Allen's future. And to be honest, when you look at star pitchers who hit the open market at age 30, it typically isn't a smart, a smart business decision to give them a long-term contract. So major question mark to see how the D-backs are going to handle Zach Gallon going forward. Like I say, with a lot of free agents, especially when it comes to guys like Zach Gallon, and Christian Walker, give me the short-term overpay. I don't want five, six, seven-year deals for any player unless they're Corbin Carroll at 22 years old. If you're 30 or older than 30, like Zach Gallon, and Christian Walker, I will gladly give them three-year deals where they're paid over $20 million. Short-term overpays, I believe, is the way to go. What to do about the bullpen? Great question by Stephen Gilbert, because right now, you look at the core for the D-backs bullpen. Thompson, Ginkle, Joe Mansply, AJ Puck, Justin Martinez. I like that five a lot. McGuff isn't coming back next year, probably. Paul Seawald isn't coming back next year, probably. D-backs need to figure out a couple more pitchers for that bullpen. I think what the D-backs need to do, you have to go out there and get another stud reliever. But I don't think that reliever has to be a closer. It can be a closer if there's someone like, I haven't taken a look at the closer free agent pool, but if there's like a Tanner Scott or someone on that level, someone that's a really high level strikeout, high velocity closer out there on the open market that the D-backs can go and get, I would be in favor of that move. Then you make Martinez and Puck as your two setup guys with Ginkle. I think that's a nasty bullpen. But I'm also okay if the D-backs just want to get another AJ Puck level reliever where the dude is 
nasty. The dude is elite, incredible, and high leverage moments. But maybe he's not your closer. Maybe still go with the Justin Martinez as your closer. Then AJ Puck and AJ Puck 2.0 are your two setup men. So regardless, I like the D-backs core of those five guys right now. But they definitely need to get one to two really good relievers, like high-level relievers, and they have to be high-velocity strikeout guys. I think the D-backs do have enough internal options where if they want to pick out one of those guys for the bullpen, a Yilber Diaz, I don't know too much about the Bryce Jarvis pitching situation. I have to check in on that, his health, a Dre Jameson or something, you know, or Blake Walston, just one random dude internally. If they want to make one of those guys, a Ryan Nelson, right, if Jordan Montgomery is back in the rotation next year, they want to make one of those guys a reliever and then go out there and get one incredible dude on the open market, I think I would be fine with that. Then the final question, who will be the new D-backs pitching coach? Major question. The D-backs let go all their pitching coaches, including the main man, Brent Strom, who was so highly anticipated when the D-backs first hired him, turned so many pitchers like Keiko, Verlander, Garrett Cole to Cy Young Award winners. And he didn't exactly do that with the D-backs when you look at the Zach Gallons and even the Brandon Fox. And so Brent Strom, when you look at the D-backs' this past season, pitching was probably their biggest area of weakness, and that falls on the pitching coach. So I thought it was justified to fire him, and now the D-backs need to go replace him this offseason. I don't know who the guy is to do that, but whoever the D-backs sign will definitely do an in-depth review of how he'll affect the D-backs' pitching staff for 2025. And now I want to discuss which World Series outcome will make me feel the best as the D-backs fan in segment number two. But hey, if you're looking to place an upcoming wager on an NFL game, then the place you want to go is going to be FanDuel because, hey, NFL fans, you can start this season with a big return on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. So when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. You'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. My favorite thing to do on FanDuel is the same game parlay. Give me the Saints money line. Give me Spencer Rattler over on total time touchdowns and give me Alvin Kamara over on total receptions when that three leg hits it brings a big smile to my face and if you want a big smile on your face just visit FanDuel.com place a five dollar bet and get two hundred dollars in bonus bets guaranteed FanDuel.com America's number one sports book All right, all right, all right. Let's get back to the Lockdown Dimebacks podcast. Let's talk about the World Series outcome. And to be honest, this is more of a personal segment topic. This is the World Series outcome that would make me feel the best as a D-backs fan, as a Lockdown Dimebacks host. This is the outcome that would make me feel the best about myself. Not seeing the D-backs, of course, in the postseason. And I can't help but feel like, After watching this playoffs, I know the D-backs were struggling that last month. And if they made the playoffs, it would have been on the backs of other teams helping them out to get into the postseason. But I can't help watching this year's postseason. If the D-backs somehow backed into the playoffs again, I think the D-backs would have at least been in the NLCS one more time because... What, you would have faced the Milwaukee Brewers in round one. I think the D-backs are definitely beating Milwaukee. And seeing how the Mets played Philly, like Philadelphia just didn't show up at all in that series. Offensively, that team was maybe the most scary from the regular season outside the D-backs. And they just didn't show up in the postseason at all. The Mets pitching shut them down. You know, the D-backs pitching has not been as good as the Mets the last couple months. But I can't help but feel like the D-backs wouldn't at least have an opportunity to be against the Dodgers in the NLCS. And that's kind of where I want to start this conversation because we got the ALCS, Yankees, Guardians, and the NLCS, Dodgers, Mets locked in. And I want to discuss which World Series outcome will make me feel the least upset, the happiest, the least sad, however you want to describe it because the the way it's trending right now, it looks like it's going to be the battle of the big markets in the World Series. And that is definitely the outcome I want the least because 
prior to the postseason starting, the San Diego Padres were my pick to go to the World Series. I had the Padres over the Braves. I had the Padres over the Dodgers. And then I had the Padres over the Phillies to go to the World Series. So I didn't even pick the Mets to beat the Phillies either or go to the NLCS. But here we are. And the Padres really disappointed me. Respect to the LA Dodgers for when they were at their most vulnerable, at their weakest. They stepped up in a big way and beat the San Diego Padres, took that series away from them. So as much as we hate the Dodgers, I do have to give respect where respect is due because they not stole, they took that series away from San Diego because I thought that series was set up for San Diego. You walk away from that game three, Padres set what the postseason record for home runs in a single game. You enter game four, no Freddie Freeman. They're starting a bullpen day. Like it's like the D backs in the postseason. Like they're starting Ryan Brazier in game four. They got no Freddie Freeman, who's a superstar, right? In that game four as well. The Padres have Dylan Cease, their superstar ace on the mound. And you lose that game. Then you lose the finale. Padres really crapped the bed. And now it's Dodgers Mets. And so when looking at the potential outcomes, by far the outcome we don't want the most is Yankees Dodgers because I grew up on the East Coast. I grew up in New Jersey. You would think I'm a Yankees fan. No, I hate the Yankees fan so much that growing up in New Jersey, also I was born in Manhattan. I grew up a Red Sox fan because that's how much of a contrarian I want to be to the New York fan base. And so Yankees Dodgers, if those two teams went to World Series, in terms of ratings and star power and fun, it would be the best outcome for the sport of baseball Otani versus Judge would maybe do the most insane numbers the MLB World Series has ever seen. But from a personal standpoint, Yankees-Dodgers means it's a lose-lose scenario because seeing Aaron Judge and the New York Yankees hold up a World Series, their second one in like the last 22 years, that would be disgusting. And then seeing the LA Dodgers, like now all of a sudden we can't talk about the Mickey Mouse ring. I would be happy for Otani, but it's like, look at the Dodgers. They spent all this money and they did win the World Series. I'm probably going to be in the World Series like the next five to 10 years. Like I don't want either of those teams to be in the World Series. And I don't want either of those teams to win the World Series. And they face off against each other. One of those two teams are going to win. And I can not see that happen so that is by far the worst case scenario now in terms of what's the worst case scenario the worst outcome in terms of fun uh i also don't want to see the outcome that provides the least fun like yankees dodgers is the most fun but also provides the most misery guardians mets provides the least misery but If we get Guardians Mets, it's probably the only World Series outcome where I really won't be invested and might not even really watch. Like Cleveland, New York Mets, I think would just be boring. Rangers, D-backs, people would have told you that was boring last year. And that's fine. To the casual fan, it was boring. And to the casual fan, a New York Mets versus Cleveland Guardians series would also be very boring. To me, I don't really want to see Cleveland on the World Series stage. The New York Mets would be pretty interesting, but a Sean Mania Luis Severino World Series is kind of nasty. Like those guys have been really good, but it would be kind of nasty in a bad way, right? Like, do you actually want to see those two guys on the biggest stage in the sport? Despite how good they've been, it would be kind of weird if those were like the frontline starters for a World Series team. And so when talking about the outcomes, the one that gives me the most misery is definitely Yankees Dodgers. But it would also be the most fun, but I, I couldn't deal with the misery of that series. Guardians Mets, least amount of fun, also least amount of misery, but I, I just don't want it. I'm not interested. That's why I believe the outcome we need, I think the outcome we need is the Subway Series. West Coast fans, you guys wouldn't care because it would be the Battle of New York, but for me, as a guy from the East Coast, seeing Yankees versus Mets, And the Mets beating the New York Yankees would be incredible. The little brother Mets who have been clowned for so long, who have dealt with so much misery in their franchise history. Yes, they have the number one payroll in the sport, but on paper, they're still considered the little brothers to the New York Yankees with the Goliaths of the Sotos, the Judges, the Giancarlo Stans, they got the Rodons, the Garrett Coles, like on paper, it is a David versus Goliath matchup if they face off in the Subway Series. 
But imagine the Mets beat the Yankees in the World Series. You go to the locker room. You watch the champagne celebration. And on the loudspeaker, you hear the New York Mets playing. They not like us. They not like us. They not like us. In a city where both the teams are from the same city of New York, one of those teams beats the other in the biggest stage and then plays not like us in the post-game locker room celebration, that would be number one in New York Mets franchise history. Now I want to discuss Lourdes Gurriel and the kind of season he had in 2024 and setting up expectations for him in 2025. Abata is a free app that lets you earn cash back every time you shop, earn on hundreds of items from groceries to beauty supplies, even toys so you can make sure you're beating inflation no matter what you're purchasing. The average Abata user earns $256 per year. That could cover the cost of an entire shopping trip, that flight you've been eyeing, or the fancy dinner you've been, cra- you've been craving. Other apps give you points that don't amount to much. With a botter, you earn cash back that you can withdraw to your bank account, PayPal, or gift cards. Simply add offers in the app, upload your receipt, and voila, the money is yours. It's time you join the over 50 million users who use a botter to earn cash back every time they shop. Right now, a botter is offering our listeners $5 to try a botter by using our code Locked on MLB when you register, just go to the App Store or Google Play Store and download the free Abata app to start earning cash back and use code Locked on MLB. That's I B O T T A I B O T T A in the Google Play or Apple App Store and use code Locked on MLB. All right, all right, all right. Let's get back to the Locked on Dimebacks podcast and let's discuss the Lord's Guriel player review this is something that we've been doing all off season long we've been talking about the weaknesses the strengths of d-backs players from the 2024 season and then setting up expectations for them for 2025 so now let's talk about lords guriel on today's player review for guriel his strengths from 2024 lefty killer strong with two outs Kills starting pitchers, and he's also a fast ball killer. When looking at the numbers for Lords Guriel, he's not a platoon player, but the splits might suggest he's getting kind of close uh, against right handed pitching. And this is one of his weaknesses that we'll talk about later, but might as well talk about it now. Uh, Lords Guriel, when we look at his hitting against right handed pitchers, 254 average, 697 OPS. But against lefties, 330, 331 average, 885 OPS. George Guriel is quite literally an MVP candidate against left-handed pitchers and barely a starting level outfielder against righties. And yes, it's a strength when there is a lefty on the mound, the ability he's able to produce, like the mound production he's able to produce when there's a lefty on the mound from a power standpoint, from a clutch situational hitting standpoint just overall contact ability like he crushes lefties against righties he's just a mere mortal and that would be an area that would be nice if Lourdes Gurriel can start to even out as his career progresses two outs Lourdes Gurriel very good in these situations we're talking about innings where he keep rallies alive how many times did you see a D-backs put up a big inning all with two outs, right? This d back team was one of the best teams in the sport when it came to two-out rallies, and Lourdes Gurriel was one of the leaders in that. And I think it's one of the marks of a great baseball team. When you never sacrifice at bats, I think that's what this d back team did all year, especially with two outs. This d back team never rolled over, and Lourdes Gurriel was one of those guys, 286 average and an 803 OPS with two outs. And if you make it two outs with runners in scoring position, a 298 average and an 831 OPS. This is a guy that never gave up an at bat. Great play discipline, great uh, vision overall. You do look at the play discipline numbers for Lord Guerrero, and they're solid. Like his strikeout rate isn't bad. He's been below, uh, he's been around like 17% like the last three seasons. The walk rate could improve. He doesn't walk enough, but in terms of overall striking out, not something that Lourdes Gurriel does a ton in his player profile. 
He is a really good player against starting pitching. We're talking about this D-backs offense this past year, right? So good that first inning, so good early in games. Gurriel was a major uh, reason as to why. I mean, against starters this past year, barely, uh, basically a 300 average and an 800 OPS. In those first two innings of a ball game, Gurriel batted like 350 with a 950 OPS. Like, he's incredible to start games and he's really good against opposing starting pitchers, especially pitchers whose primary pitch is the fastball. Guriel is a tremendous fastball hitter, a 320 average against the fastball this past season. You throw something upper middle of the zone against Guriel, and he is more than likely going to crush it. And also something that was really strong from Guriel this past season he was great as a pinch hitter. He was really clutch coming off the bench, which is an underrated part of this D-backs team this past season. Gritchick, Gurriel, you go up and down the roster. So many guys were just great off the bench in these clutch situations where you might have needed a big hit late in the game. Gurriel, he was five for nine in pinch hitting situations this past year with two home runs and six RBIs. Just a really good player. And it was a very smart move by Mike Hazen, a kind of a throwing piece in the Dalton, Var- Dalton Varsho, Gabriel Moreno trade. Lord Gurriel has been so important to the D-back so far. But what are some of his weaknesses? Through two years, Lord Gurriel has shown us he can only be good for a half. In 2023, he was an MVP candidate like the first half of the season, then struggled in the second half. This past year, struggled in the first half, 264 average, 717 OPS in the first half, but in the second half, 312 average, 844 OPS. I would like to see a more full season from Lourdes Gurriel. His hard contact numbers also trending in the wrong direction. Hard hit percentage, exit velocity. That is something you don't want to see start trending in the wrong direction. Uh, We already saw his power diminish a little bit from this past season, 24 to 18 home runs. So we don't like to see the power going in the wrong direction. I'm okay with less home runs if it means the doubles and overall contact ability trend in the right direction. That's the only way to justify hard contact going down if overall contact goes up, quality contact if that goes up. Struggles against righties, like we discussed, need him to get more even in his platoon splits because I don't want Lord Gurriel turning into Jesse Winker. And also, he needs to be better in high leverage moments. He was not good in certain clutch situations this past year. 207 average, 625 OPS in high leverage moments. Gurriel was great early in games. First couple innings, elite. Against starting pitchers, elite. But late game situations, he struggled. 239 average, six. 18 OPS, inning 7 through 9 against relievers this past year, 674 OPS. Like, Lords Gurriel, not good in high leverage moments against relievers. Late game situations like Gurriel needs to be better late in games because he's so important to what this D-backs offense wants to do. If he doesn't come through late, it's kind of hard justifying batting him third like as much as Tori Lavella wants to do. So for his goals for 2025, get back to, <clears throat> excuse me, Get back to play that we saw more in 2023 where he saw a little bit more power and I need more of a full season production, not just a half season. Give me a full season production, a little bit more power and even out those platoon splits for me. Now that's it for this edition of the Locked Dimebacks podcast. Come back tomorrow for more Dimebacks news coverage and insight. And as always, stay safe, stay healthy. Doses.